Now let's look at the genetic evidence. In my estimation, this is the most formidable challenge to the idea that humans were created de novo. They were created new, and they weren't a part of a, a shared common ancestor with the great apes. Again, let me reiterate, monkeys didn't evolve into apes. Um, lemurs go back the furthest, but then eventually those turn into uh, uh, the, the greater uh, class of hominids. And eventually, you're, under that rubric, you have a, a shared ancestor six to 10 million years ago that eventually split off into the great apes, Neanderthals, and all of the different species in the Homo genus. So, as I said, I think the fossil evidence is the weakest evidence, but I do think that the genetic evidence is the strongest evidence for common descent between the great apes and humans. I'm not trying to look at all of uh, common descent throughout uh, natural history, going back 3.8 billion years to the last universal common ancestor, some kind of an amoeba. I'm just trying to keep this very focused on our relationship uh, as uh, human beings and uh, the place from which we originated. There are a number of different arguments in favor of common descent between uh, the great apes and Homo sapiens. The first is that humans and chimps share something on the order of 99% genetic similarity. And when you look at that, and we've already predicted that, that chimpanzees are our nearest uh, hominid cousins, and they're close to us, so uh, we would have to say that if that prediction was already made, and then later we find out that we have 99% genetic similarity, that that would be a great confirmation that indeed we are in some way connected in an ancestral relationship. The rebuttal to this is that when we look at the genetic code, this would work just as well on the idea of common design as it would on the idea of common descent. So when you look at software engineers, they do not recreate all of their code when they move from computer to computer. How are these computers even going to integrate with each other if you're starting with entirely different code and entirely different programs and so forth, you actually, it would be prudent if you're trying to integrate all of these different machines to use similar code, even repetitive code between all of these different machines. Well, the same thing is true when it comes to chimps and humans. I honestly don't know what we ought to expect when we think of the idea that chimps are, you know, the genes and the alleles are forming the same proteins in the chimp body. They're forming the same enzymes. They're forming uh, the same atmosphere. Or the same, we're, we're in the same biosphere. What would it even mean to say that we're not in some way genetically similar and yet we can eat each other? How do you, how do you have a food chain if we don't have genetic similarity? You would just be projectile vomiting anything that you put into your body because you couldn't digest anything that's not similar to yourself. Now, of course, right there, I'm not saying that we're eating chimpanzees, like in uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, okay? Is that the right one? Indiana Jones 2? Temple of Doom, thank you. I really did not want that to be wrong. Uh, Temple of Doom, I'm not saying that we're eating chimps. What I'm saying is if chimps are eating uh, plants and uh, fauna and flora and we're eating plants and fauna and flora, what does it even mean to say that we should be genetically so distinct from one another that we couldn't be able to have the same biosphere, share the same biosphere, and have the same food chain? Moreover, why would you have different genes for common proteins that work and common enzymes that work? And I mean, right on down the line. Furthermore, genes aren't the complete picture of what it means to be a biological organism. When we look at changes in the genome, small, small changes result in large, large effects. I mean, this is where a lot of the uh, uh, genetic disorders originate. A very, very small mutation 
uh, that, that can result in a, a very serious condition. Now, if a small, little, tiny sequence can be changed in the genome, and that can result in uh, a, a, a total calamity for that individual or the species, then when we're saying 1% different, that is, I mean, go into your computer and just shuffle around 1% of the computer code. I mean, when I touch my computer at all, when it's having trouble, it seems like it only goes from bad to worse. Same thing is true here. All right, in addition to this, there's such a thing as epigenetics. In Greek, the word epi means above. So in the last several decades, what they've discovered is that there's the genes, and genes are just the DNA sequence on a locus of the, uh, uh, the DNA itself. So a gene, in concert with many other genes, produces a trait. So if you're going to oversimplify this, you would say you have the gene of having blue eyes, or you have the gene of having an earlobe that connects versus one that doesn't. In reality, it's multiple genes working together to produce different traits in the person. But what they've discovered is that in addition to having genes that create traits and genes which are alleles that show different forms of those traits, they've actually discovered that there's epigenetic information, that we have 200 different cell types, you know, uh, heart cells, liver cells, lung cells, and yet all of those share the same genetic information, but they have a unique epigenetic genome that turns them into one cell versus another. These are basically molecular um, uh, parts of the genome that create gene regulation, gene expression. Think of them as off and on switches. So certain genes in a certain period would eventually turn into cancer. Okay? They would lead to a trait. If that switch was on, it would lead to a tumor. But if the epigenetic um, you know, uh, 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 molecule is set up in the right place, then it'll shut that off. If it's turned on, it turns into a liver cell. If it's turned off, it turns into a heart cell, and so on and so forth. So this is something, not genes themselves, but these are chemical traits that cling onto the genes that actually serve as an ability to either increase or interfere with the copying of genes. So, so to say, well, we share 99% of the same genes, that's like saying, my house and your house share 99% wood, screws, nails, iron, plumbing. Okay, that's great. That's great. They do. They do. 99%. You're right. You're right. But why is it that your house is beautiful and my house is falling apart? Why is it that your house is structured in a certain way and mine isn't? There's something over the genes that, that serve as an ability to actually turn on genes, regulate genes, and express genes in different ways. Finally, this percentage is very complex and very exaggerated. Uh, go back to the 2007 article, Relative Differences, The Myth of 1% by John Cohen. This whole idea that we just se sequence the chimp genome with the human genome, do you know that the whole scaffolding for the human genome is used and overlaid on the chimp genome? So when the chimp genome was finally broken, that was years after the human genome, uh, Francis Collins, the chimp genome was overlaid with the human genome. Parts that are duplicates in the human genome, like let's say you've got A, T, G, C, C, G, T, A, okay, you get all that, and there's a doublet, but there's only one of those paragraphs in the chimp genome that was cut out of the study. What about when the, the base pairs are reversed, totally reversed? That was cut out of the study. Basically, they spliced the parts that are doublets or are in reversal or anything like that. That was taken out. And the remainder, what was left is 99% the same. So we're starting with a base of a human genome over the chimp and then parts that are doublets or anything else, those were taken out. So this is exaggerated. And finally, um, I don't even know what we should make of this. So this is from uh, Jonathan Marks' book, 
what it means to be 98% chimpanzee. Let's say we start with a human. I'm talking about just an average, homely looking person, just, just an average Joe, nothing to look at, somebody like Ryan Reynolds, okay? Just, just, you know, partially ugly, not charismatic at all, just a regular average Joe guy. If we look at Ryan Reynolds and we compare him to a chimpanzee, they have 95% genetic similarity. What does that mean? And that is the number that's come in recently. 95% similarity, the 99, 98.5, that's a myth. The 95% between a human and a chimpanzee is actually accurate. What does it mean, though? What does it mean when we say that we're 80% genetically similar to a mouse? Are we 80% mouse? Am I 95% chimp? We are 35% daffodil. Okay, am I one-third flower? <laughs> um, am I, you know, four-fifths? Mouse, am I, you get the idea, 19, 20th um, chimpanzee? Uh, what does it even mean? What are we supposed to do with that data when we know that genetic similarity doesn't tell us the whole picture and we should expect similarity in the animal kingdom? Number two, another evidence for common descent is junk DNA, which under the, the general rubric of Junk DNA would be called pseudogenes. Pseudogenes would be a type of junk DNA. Pseudogenes are basically genes that were once functional in the genome, but they became dead. They stopped working. But because they're not working, they're kind of along for the genetic ride. They're still in the genome, but they're just not really being used. They're just kind of there and they don't have any kind of function, they don't do anything, they're, as the name says, pseudo-genes. Junk DNA is the majority of the DNA in our body. And you think about how much we actually use in the body, uh, in our genome, very little. The preponderance of DNA in the genome is just junk. It isn't used for anything. The difficulty is, if it's junk, why is it the same junk? Why is it the same pseudogenes as we find in chimps and the great apes? If all of this is lining up together, it isn't functioning. What did, what did God do? He, he put in the same junk that doesn't do anything in the chimps and the great apes and us, even though we split off. He deactivated certain genes and made them pseudogenes, but he did that in all of the same places, in chimp DNA as well as human DNA. This is a very good argument for universal, well, not universal, but common descent between us and the great apes. What's the response? 80% of so-called junk DNA has functional elements. Has. Yeah. So they discovered that 80% has functional elements. The ENCODE project, this is the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements, ENCODE, found this was, okay, a $130 million international project. 450 research scientists came together in a consortium to study the functionality of the genome. And what they found is that the junk DNA, 80% of it, has functional elements. That means it's not junk. Junk DNA is a complete misnomer. That's, all right, here's an article from 2012. The title is, The ENCODE, excuse me, the ENCODE Project Writes Eulogy for Junk DNA. This whole idea that you have junk in your DNA, now some of it we don't know what it does. We don't know the function, but 80% of it, uh, we do know that it is functional. One example that I love is uh, beta-globin pseudogene. This is uh, used by Kenneth Miller. I don't know if you followed the uh, Dover trial. Uh, I didn't really like it, but uh, it was the intelligent design versus the evolutionists in the schools in 2005. And Kenneth Miller testified, he said, uh, this pseudogene is junk. It does nothing. Why would it be in the genome? 
and Eugenie Scott, who is the director of um, science education in America. She's a big bat. She's brilliant. She's intelligent. And she's at the front of uh, promoting evolution and denying any kind of creation or design because in the school system, she's just like, we don't need superstition. We don't need religion, separation of church and state. That's her whole thinking. She appealed to this as well. This pseudogene does nothing. And what is it doing there in the genome? Until, that was in 2005 and 2007 respectively, in 2013, 2013, 2013, they found out that beta globin pseudogene actually isn't non-functional, it is functional. And then in 2021, one study said this, it is, quote, essential and indispensable for red blood cells. We kind of need those. We need red blood cells. So what was formerly held to be junk actually is essential to gene regulation and gene expression in red blood cells to the point that they refer to the essentiality, essentiality and the indispensability of this pseudo gene. Here is Francis Collins. He's a uh, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. He led the Human Genome Project. He cracked the code on the human genome, three point, excuse me, 3.2 billion base pairs, mapped it all out. That, that's what he's putting on his gravestone. I mean, this guy, he's the director of the National Institutes of Health. He served under multiple presidents. And if you see him interviewed, he just seems like a great guy. I mean, he just seems happy. He was, he was in a dialogue with Richard Dawkins, and Dawkins is all mean and upset. And Francis Collins is just smiling and happy and just happy to be there. You know, he worked during uh, the pandemic 100 hours a week, 100 hours a week to get this under control. The guy is just, I like him. I like him. However, <laughs> in his book, The Language of God, in uh, 2006, he said this, compelling evidence for a common ancestor comes from the study of ancient repetitive elements, or AREs. Now, I don't know if you can see this very well, but essentially this uh, picture from his book says that in the human genome, which is on the top, and the mouse genome, which is on the bottom, you have these barcodes, is what they look like. They're ancient repetitive elements. It's gobbledygook. It, it, it doesn't do anything. But this non-functional junk DNA is found in the same place in mice as well as in humans. When this book hit, I mean, people were, were really excited because Francis Collins was a convert from atheism. He's a leading Christian thinker. They love that about it. But when this book hit on this part, this was very divisive in the Christian community because here you had a leading Christian biologist saying, actually, uh, common descent, it's, it's provable, we got to give up this idea that we came from an original pair. Why would God put useless AREs into our genome and the mouse genome? This was very persuasive in our own fellowship, where people said, we got to start to rethink this, because what we're seeing is that this, this has to show common descent, unless God is going into the genome of mice and of humans to put these mistakes in there. He writes, AREs, these ancient repetitive elements, are capable of copying and inserting themselves into various other locations in the genome, usually without any functional consequences. Roughly 45% of the human genome is made up of such genetic flotsam and jetsam. Just junk. 45% is this, these ancient repetitive elements, these pseudogenes. Now, they have all different types of junk DNA, but 45% is just this. Until he gave a talk years later where he said this in 2016. So 10 years pass. 10 years pass. In terms of junk DNA, we don't use that term anymore because I think it was pretty much a case of hubris or pride to imagine that we could dispense with any part of the genome as if we knew enough to say it wasn't functional. Most of the genome that we used to think was there for space turns out to be doing stuff. Yeah, 80% of it. 
This is 10 years later. Guys, that's a key principle we need to keep in mind. Not to jump on the newest bandwagon and just to follow that, you know, hit yourself to that train. Here we have the same man writing. Now, now kudos to him for coming forward and saying, I was wrong. But I hope that we can have a little bit, a little bit of patience when we see the science is coming out one by one. All right, number three, endogenous retroviruses or ERVs. All right, this is the same concept. Ancient ancestors of ours had um, retro viruses. Retro, like you have retro clothes. What's that mean? They're old, right? Virus, what's that mean? Virus. So retroviruses, ancient viruses, attacked certain parts of the genome, attack certain genes. And these are endogenous, meaning that because that happened to a distant, distant, distant ancestor, that you, because they already had their scarring on their genome, you inherited these endogenous retroviruses into your genome. So parts of your genome are basically and essentially destroyed or rendered inert and effete by these retroviruses. And we've inherited them, and guess who else has? Chimpanzees and the great apes. You can point to ERVs and other species. Why would God do that? Why would he just go through and, and push on parts of the genome in the human genome, but then also do it in the, in the chimp genome? That doesn't make any sense. Unless there's widespread evidence of function for ERVs, precisely in areas not of genes. See, it's so myopic to say, well, this gene uh, leads to this trait, or this allele leads to this uh, manifestation of this trait. It's so tunnel vision. Gene regulation, gene expression, these ERVs actually do serve a purpose. Like, I wonder what purpose they could serve. Immune function to repel viral infections. What do they do when you get struck with uh, an ERV in your ancient past? It has the ability to fight off viral infections. Are you seeing a pattern here? This would be a case of convergent evolution. That if it's the case that, that, that humans don't produce uh, the uh, particular enzyme to make vitamin C, and chimps don't produce it either, that could be a case of convergent evolution because we have access to oranges and we've got access to fruit. The same thing is true here. What if we were all getting hit with the same viruses and yet these have a, an actual function in helping our immune systems today? Finally, and here's the big one. Did humans come from a 10,000 person bottleneck? This goes back to Francis Collins back in 2006, Language of God. He said, we can't get around this anymore. There was no bottleneck of two. That's silly. And more recently, in 2016, 2017 rather, Dennis Venema, who is an Oxford-trained biologist, and Scott McKnight, who is a theologian, they wrote the book, Adam and the Genome. And in the first four chapters of the book, Dennis Venema showed that it's ridiculous, it's silly to believe that we came from an original pair. We need to rethink this, and we need to have room for the idea that, that, that uh, frankly, that uh, we came from a population. And the population was no smaller at any point in our history than 10,000 people. Sorry, but I mean, we, we've got to face the facts. And on the back of the book, it said, this is going to be uh, a heartbreak. This is going, I can't remember the language. I look at the back of the book sometime. This is going to make uh, Bible-believing Christians have to rethink their entire worldview and all that. Well, then the next four chapters were written by McKnight, and he was kind of retroactively saying, yeah, and the Bible teaches that. Uh, we looked at him on week one. Well, uh, did we come from a population bottleneck of 10,000 people? Here's what Dennis Venemai has to say. He writes, we descend from a population that never dipped below about 10,000 individuals. We can be confident that finding evidence that we were created independently of other animals or that we descend from only two people just isn't going to happen. Some ideas in science are so well supported 
that it is highly unlikely new evidence will substantially modify them, and these are among them. Number one, the sun is at the center of our solar system. Two, humans evolved. And three, we evolved as a population. So what is he saying? He's saying that the idea that we evolved from a population of 10,000 people has such certainty it could be dubbed heliocentric certainty. That this scientific fact is so certain that it's as certain as the fact that the earth goes around the sun rather than the sun going around the earth. What do you say? What do you, what do you say to a professor of biology trained at Oxford when he's saying that this is so certain that it's like, what are we saying now? That we're, we're geocentrists? Well, the book came out in 2017. In 2018, Richard Buggs, who's an evolutionary genomicist, engaged Venema on the BioLogos Forum. BioLogos is a theistic evolution ministry. Uh, my problem with it is I'm trying to find the theistic part in theistic evolution in BioLogos. Uh, it's mostly just the evolution part. And they're trying to show, no, this, the Bible isn't teaching that, and uh, we got to go with the complete naturalistic paradigm. It, it's methodological naturalism. We believe in God, but when we get into methodology, uh, we don't allow God to do anything. Like Jesus can perform miracles, but not God the Father. God the Son can do miracles, but not God the Father. God the Holy Spirit can do miracles, but not God the Father. Not in creation. Maybe in redemption, but not in creation. Well, Richard Buggs went on the BioLogos forum, and he started to debate with Dennis Venema. And everyone was attracted to this debate, because here we have two heavyweights, Christians, but uh, Bugs, not, not really, you know, uh, trying to argue anything real specific. I mean, he's just saying, I don't think your evidence is really that good. And uh, I'm an evolutionary biologist too. And can you help me? I mean, if you read the debate, it's on there. It's, it's frozen. You can see, he's like, can you help me understand? He's British. He's very polite. <laughs> he's like, can you help me understand this and stuff? And Venema just keeps saying, well, the field as a whole. Uh, well, there's papers that have confirmed uh, well, everybody knows. And Bugs just kept going, uh, the field as a whole, like where? And what papers? And he'd show me a paper. And he would give him a title, and he'd read the title. And he'd be like, it's not in there. Where'd you get that idea? All right. Venema appealed to five essential arguments. That there needed to be a 10,000-person population at minimum because we have too many alleles in the current genome for one couple to originate all of that. You say, what's an allele? Well, an allele is kind of like a gene, um, to be very articulate. Alleles are the sequence of DNA letters on any given locus. But think of a gene giving a trait. But the allele would give you the type of trait. So the gene would give you ice cream, but the allele would give you vanilla, chocolate, mint chocolate chip, Superman, right? The, the gene would give you eye color, the allele would give you blue, green, brown, right? So there's so many different alleles that that couldn't have just come from one couple. If the first couple only had two children, the alleles, the, the diversity of genetic information would just go right through the floor. Like if the first couple had two kids and you've already got a, a homozygous a couple, that very little alleles already, and then they give birth to two kids, and they give birth to two and to two. All of a sudden, you're just losing, you're losing this genetic diversity, and the alleles would disappear. And yet, when we look at our current population, we see tons of diversity in the alleles. So this couldn't have come from an original pair. Genetic drift, think of like drifting out to sea, okay? The, the genetic diversity would just go away with each subsequent generation. Response, <laughs> Joshua Swamidas doesn't pull any punches. He says, this is completely wrong-headed, and it's a complete category error. All right, more alleles in the population, the, the genome right now, are unrelated to the size of the original population. That's what Swam now Swamidas is a population geneticist. He says, this whole argument is just a category error. It has nothing to do with the original size of the population. 
We're talking about two different categories, size and diversity. Not divergence. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But the diversity of genetic information, he says that has nothing to do with it. Furthermore, the more kids that you have, the more genetic variation you pass on. Where did we get this idea that the first human couple had two kids? And they had two kids. And they had two kids. Richard Buggs, now he's not quoting the Bible, I am. But Richard Buggs says, if you had six, seven, eight, or nine kids, you would have no question the same amount of uh, allele diversity in the, in the current genomic uh, 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 genome, the, the current uh, uh, genetic information. So it would be indistinguishable whether you had a group of 10,000 or if you had two. So that's exactly what we read in our Bible. Be fruitful and multiply. It does not say have 2.4 kids, get a white picket fence and you know a Honda minivan. Okay, it doesn't say that. It says be fruitful and multiply. And that is exactly what they did. They had other sons and daughters. Genesis 5 verse 4. And they lived for 800 years. So they are pumping out kids like, like a lot. Number two, the argument is the estimation of the population is never fewer than 10,000 people. So Bugs pressed him on this. How do you know it was never fewer? Well, here's a paper that says, here's the, the size of the population, 10,000, 10,000, 10,000. So the argument here is the more alleles, the bigger the starting population size. So if we've got a lot of alleles, a lot of genetic diversity in our current genome, that must mean that we started from a relatively big population size, but not two. And it must have been around 10,000 people. Okay? Many factors can affect population estimates. Where did we get this number of 10,000? Well, well, from the amount of diversity in the alleles and the genes, we could say it was about 10,000. But if you divide the population, that's going to change the diversity of alleles, because now you've got population A, B, C, D, and E. They're going to start to have their own mutations, their own alleles, more kids, population boom, and so forth. If you have migration between populations, so now population A, some of the guys are on a Friday night, go over to population B, and they meet up with some of the girls, and they have a dance, and then nine months later, they pop out some kids, all right, then they have more allele variation. Um, undetected mutation rates. This was Bugs' big point, is uh, saying uh, it had to have been 10,000, not two. How do you know that? When mutation rates bring in more diversity. And you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between 10,000 starting or two with different mutation rates. It would be completely hidden. Finally, here's the biggest mistake on this one, and this is embarrassing. Uh, Venema was using these average population sizes, 10,000, as a minimum population size. Do you see the difference? Uh, I say to you, hey, I'm investing my money in this stock. Well, how much does it yield? Well, on average, it yields 6%. Oh, 6% on average. So that means it's a minimum? A minimum 6%? Well, no, no, it's an average 6% uh, growth. I mean, sometimes it's 12%. 12%, I thought you said 6. Well, sometimes it's 12. Sometimes it's 2. Sometimes it's in the negatives. Sometimes it's nothing. Sometimes I don't get it. I break even for the year. The same is true when it comes to these population sizes. The average is 10,000. But do you think that the population size stayed at a perfect 10,000. It never went to 9,999. It never dipped. Of course it did. And here's, here's the uh, undefeated point. To say that humans always had a 10,000 person population, think about that for just about four seconds. Was there a point on planet Earth where there were zero humans? You, 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 you can do it. You can nod. Yeah. Yeah. There was a point where there were zero humans. So the idea that we couldn't go below a 10,000 person population is, is false on its face. 
It's patently false. It has to be false. All right, number three. The argument is that shared alleles, we have shared alleles with chimpanzees, what's called trans-species variation. So if chimps have uh, shared alleles, you know, certain traits in their genome, and we have those same exact traits, we couldn't have a single couple pass on that much genetic information between us and the chimpanzees. That's trans-species variation. That's got to go back real far. And the origin must be way earlier and from a bigger group. Evolution happens in groups, not in individuals. That's his argument. Well, this one gets a little bit technical. I'll just get right to the point. The best author, the best scientist is Francisco Ayala. He's on the West Coast. Was the only one to have any paper that said that there was more than four alleles on the uh, human lineage. However, this didn't happen. Uh, we, ha we don't have a single study that empirically shows that we have more alleles on the actual uh, genome than is uh, posited by uh, Venema. Convergent evolution. If chimpanzees form certain alleles and genes and traits on their genome, and they're living in the same area as humans, couldn't it be possible that we form the same alleles, the same types of traits on our genome. Argument number four, the divergence of allele variation in a species. The divergence, not the diversity, but the divergence, that these are so separate from one another, so different from one another, the, the divergence of these traits on the genome. Well, Ann Gager, she says, the first humans could have been front-loaded with initial created diversity. Initial created diversity. So there's so much divergence in these genes and these alleles and these traits. Uh, that couldn't have come from a single couple unless the first couple was front-loaded with a ton of diversity in their genome. Well, it, uh, Gager in her 2019 paper said that if you go back two million years, there's no way, one way or the other, to prove or disprove an original couple. No way. Two, two million years would take you to Homo erectus, okay? But then she says, if the original couple wasn't homozygous, but they were heterozygous, remember your Punnett squares, uh, big B, big B, little B, little B, big B, little B, big B, little B, you remember those? Okay, if they had four alleles, instead of just uh, the one, that would cut down the time frame, not to two million years, but it would cut it by 25%. That would take you down to 500,000 years ago. Let me repeat that. There is no way to prove one way or the other whether we had an original pair 500,000 years ago. Number five, interspecies breeding, intergression data getting DNA from other hominins, like, like who? Neanderthals and so forth. Why do we have one or 2% Neanderthal DNA? That shows that we have a common ancestor, Heidelbergensis, and that goes back all the way to Erectus, and then you're back into the uh, millions of years ago, and it had to have come from uh, a big group of people. Actually, uh, the 2%, 1% Neanderthal DNA, this would only be for Europeans. Africans, they don't have it because it was the Europeans that went into Europe and uh, interbred with Neanderthals. And that's why uh, scientists say we have 2% Neanderthal DNA. We'll return to that subject next week. But for now, that's the argument, okay? If this is true, if we later interbred with Neanderthals, and if we got some of their genetic material in our genome, what would that prove about a 10,000 person origin? Nothing. Not, not a single thing. All it would show is that we got genetic material after having an original start to the human race. Now, we would have to say that this happened before 40,000 years ago because Neanderthals uh, were extinct by 40,000 years ago. But all this would say is that uh, we interbred, gross. <laughs> I really don't know what to think about that. Or you could say Neanderthals are human. You could go that route. And that would still take you back to a common ancestor at 500,000 years ago. And that's Gager's point, that's Bugs's point, that's Swamidas's point. So, 
just to bring all this together. I don't know if you followed all that. I'm not even sure if I did. All right. Ann Gager, Richard Buggs, and Joshua Swamidas, all experts in their field, showed that an original pair could exist 500,000 years ago. There is no way to prove or disprove this. Period. End of story. End of discussion. End of debate. Venema acknowledged this and admitted that he was wrong. He was associated with Biologos, and they had all these pages and articles that said that an original pair, Adam and Eve, were wrong. They went through and they deleted all of those articles off their website. So, 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 the sun is at the center of our solar system. Humans evolved, and we evolved as a population. Wrong, wrong. And guess how long it took to figure that out? Two years, two years. Uh, heliocentrism, uh, that, that took a while for us to really concretize in modern thinking. But this, this theory that he put out there, that, oh, oh yeah, that we started with a population of 10,000, it's, it's as heliocentric certainty. That's how certain this is. Two years later, he came forward. Well, uh, let me read it for you. Uh, Richard Buggs, toward the end of the debate, he said, uh, you would do your readers a service if you wrote a blog to tell them now, as far as you are able, that present-day genomic diversity in humans does not preclude a bottleneck in the human lineage between approximately 700,000 and 7 million years ago. I think you owe this to them and to everyone who has taken the time to participate in this discussion. To which Venema replied, I've already agreed with this. <laughs> You can tell he's a little bit frustrated. I already agreed with this, and it's been up there for weeks now. You're welcome to publicize it as you wish. I don't work for Biologos, so you can take it up with them. Later, we read an article from the uh, Biologos website. Well, the real Adam, please stand up. The surprising theology of universal ancestry. This is uh, written by Michael J. Murray, philosopher, and Deborah Harzma. She's the president of Biologos. She said, in recent years, Christian scholars have been actively discussing whether a historical atom can fit with evolutionary science. While some say no, others say yes, proposing a variety of scenarios that view Adam and Eve as real historical people and accept the scientific evidence for human evolution. However, in the discussion, some have made premature claims, including some articles at Biologos, recently updated, vis-a-vis uh, -vis deleted, that evolutionary science and population genetics rule out scenarios with a recent universal human ancestor or with a de novo created ancestral pair. Are you seeing, are you seeing a pattern here? It's junk DNA, it's flotsam and jetsam, 45%. Ten years later, I can't believe we had the hubris to say that we could just get rid of part of the genome. We have heliocentric certainty that we always had a 10,000 person uh, population. Two years later, I was wrong, publicized as much as you want. I don't think the sales on that book are doing very well. Within two years, it was shot down. Well, we talked about a lot tonight. Let's see if we can bring this together with some clear communication. How do you communicate this in a clear and concrete way? I don't think you're going to be able to have a two-hour-long conversation with a friend. At least my friends won't listen to me for that long. Number one, I would say, how did Genesis get so much right about the origin of humanity? I am feeling skeptical of the argument from mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosomal Adam, um, but that's not a biblical teaching. That's a scientific teaching. What we're looking at from the Bible is, what does it get right? The Big Bang got that right, Genesis 1.1. It gets right that humans were created last. It gets the geographical location. It gets all of the details right that, that any generation in human history would need to know. Like, where, where was it? And when were they, when were they created? And, and who created them? And Like, they couldn't go into the genomics with an ancient Israelite population. But they could say, humans came last, and God created them, it was in this area, and they got that part right. I like to kind of mess with people and say, how do you think he knew that? You know, if you ask an ancient Jewish person, ancient Israelite, how did they get that right? You guys aren't scientists, you're not philosophers. How did you get that right? You know what they would have said? God told us. 
That's how. So I think this speaks to divine revelation, the fact that we get the main contours right. I know that doesn't solve everything. I get that. But it does get the main, main message correct. We should not overlook that. All right, number two, another way to express this is it's not that I disagree with the science. I don't disagree with the science. Scientists are our friends, or they're our allies, not our enemies. Uh, I know some Christians that basically are averse to science, and it's, it's pretty nauseating. That's not the issue. I agree with the dates. I agree with the data. That's not the point. It's the interpretation of the science. So when Venema says it was a 10,000-person bottleneck, no lower. Okay, that's an assertion. That's an interpretation. But then somebody like a Richard Bogg says, wait a minute, how do you know that? And they go through argument by argument by argument to the point where Venema says, you're right. And again, if I didn't say this already, kudos to him to be able to say I was wrong. That takes a heck of a lot of humility. Now, I will say he came back with a jab and he said, but you don't have any proof that Adam and Eve existed anyways. <laughs> so uh, that's not the point. That's not the point. Their argument wasn't that we have proof. The point is that you're overstating your case. And I think that should be a key lesson for us. How do you know the interpretation of the scientific data is accurate? Finally, number three, with so much rhetoric, isn't it responsible to adopt a posture of wait and see? If there is anything I could leave you with in this course, it would be that bit of wisdom. Don't jump on the next bandwagon that you see on BuzzFeed, okay? Oh, there's a new finding. Okay, that's fine. We'll look into that. We'll study it. But wait and see. If there's anything we can see here, it's that the history of science is one where there's revisions, there's checks, there's balances, there's other people looking at the data, and um, we're going to let them figure that out. We're not going to say the science is wrong. We're going to say we want to see how this, the scientists figure this out. And then we can jump in and say, how did you guys come to those conclusions? And uh, yeah, figure out how their interpretations of the data comport with reality. But again, wait and see. Don't just read another book and say, well, I guess it's all over. <laughs> Give it some time. And uh, you'll see that the biblical worldview, it comes through time and time and time again.